The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. Tonight on The Agenda. This story really raises some very interesting questions about power in this country, about the broader telecommunications industry, and then of course about family controlled companies. Then. The really important thing to understand about curiosity is the mind hates unfinished business. And so if you start to introduce something or if you catch, catch their mind but then don't complete that thought or that idea, then they want to keep thinking about it more. The merger of Canada's two largest telecoms, Rogers and Shaw, sparked a corporate drama of epic proportions in the spring of 2021. And the full throttled fight for control of an empire spanned not just the boardroom, but also within a deeply divided family. Alexandra Posadsky is a telecom reporter for the Globe and Mail and helped pull back the curtain for the rest of us throughout that dust-up. She maps out the whole story in her new book. It's called Rogers vs. Rogers, The Battle for Control of Canada's Telecom Empire. And Alexandra joins us now here in the studio. Good to meet you. Good to meet you, This too. is your first book? It is. Holy smokes. This is really a very good book for your first book. Thank you very much. I don't know I whether to be that. very impressed or hate you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this is a... I mean, people will obviously, because it was so public, they will know elements of this story. But you are also uncovering in this book details, many of which we did not know, and many of which the protagonists and antagonists in this story would not want to get out. So my question is, how difficult was it to get you know, the, the best verifiable version of the truth. It was certainly challenging. Um, a number of people, of course, did not want to speak to me for this book. And Name names. <laughs> Who wouldn't talk to you? Well, I mean, if you look at the um, end of the book, essentially you can see that I spoke to hundred and over 120 people, and the vast majority of them spoke only on the condition that their identities remain confidential. Mm -hmm. um, and it's actually easier to name names of who would speak on the record than it is to say who wouldn't speak on the record. Um, I did get to interview the company's lead director, uh, Robert Gemmel, on the record. I spoke to Matthew Boswell, the commissioner of competition. Um, you know, the, the remainder of them essentially, because they are confidential, I can't say who I spoke to. So if you did talk to Ed Rogers, the chair and basically the guy around whom much of the story flows, if you did talk to him, it was either not for attribution or off the record, or you can confirm that you did not talk to him. Um, all I can just say is that, you know, I spoke to over 120 okay. people. Okay, no, I get it, I get it. I'm not, uh, I get it, I get it, okay. Why do you think it's important? I mean, this is, uh, of course, it's a big business story. Mm -hmm. It's a sad family drama at one level as well. Why do you think it's important that, you know, people in this country know what went on with this company? Well, I think Rogers is a really significant company in this country. They touch millions of people's lives, not just through their cable and their wireless business, also through the media companies that they own, as well as through their sports empires. And, you know, they own the Rogers Center, so they employ tens of thousands of people. They're a widely held stock in people's uh, pension funds and mutual funds. And so they're a very, very significant Canadian company. And I think that this story really raises some very interesting interesting questions about power in this country, about the broader telecommunications industry, and then of course about family controlled companies because we have a lot of these companies in Canada that are controlled by families and you know, I think that there's a discussion that we need to have about, you know, some of the potential drawbacks of that. Of course, there are benefits as well, but there are also challenges when you have essentially one person in charge of a massive uh, company like this. My first ever full-time job was for Ted Rogers, the guy at the center of this story, the sign of the Rogers empire. Uh, I was a city hall reporter at CHFI, which he owned, and CFTR, you know, that a FMAM brother-sister station. And Ted was a genius, and you knew, and even me at 22 knew that. You could tell. What made him so? Well, the thing that people really credit Ted with is this incredible ability to anticipate the future and to see things that other people can't see. 
Uh, so, for example, he took a big gamble by getting into wireless at a time when, you know, it was not clear. I mean, now it seems so obvious in retrospect that wireless was going to be at the center of our lives, but at the time it wasn't so. And he was talking about it 40 years ago. And even his yeah. own wife voted against the company going into wireless. Yes. He had to invest his own money in order to do that, and he was willing to do that. He took huge risks. He was a big risk taker, and he had this sort of dogged determination from when he was very young to despite all of his numerous health challenges to restore the Rogers family name back into prominence. Well, you say restore the name because he's not the first Edward S. Rogers. His That's dad right. was. Yep. Tell us about his dad. Well, his dad was the inventor of the first batteryless radio, and he died in his 30s of a ruptured aneurysm when Ted was just a boy. And his mother, unfortunately, effect effectively sold all of the family business and was left with very little. And it was her who kind of instilled in Ted this desire to regain what the family had lost. CFRB Radio. That's Canada's right. first Rogers batteryless. Yep. That's what it stands for. There we go. At what point did Ted start to think about? Okay, so uh, let me back up a step here. Th there's this notion that he's got to reclaim the family empire. Mm -hmm. There's this notion that he's got to make his father, pr the father that he right that he lost when he was so young. He's got to make that father proud. How do you think that animates him as he goes through his career? Well, I think, you know, one really major aspect in which this came into play was that he was always planning for his own death, right? Because he had all of these health setbacks and because he didn't want his children to go through what he had gone through, what his mother had gone through in terms of losing everything that the family had. And so he was very, very obsessed with planning for his succession. He was very obsessed with trying to set up a structure that would allow the Rogers family to maintain control over their empire for as many generations, he writes, as tax law would allow. And so this, of course, was had two components. There was the planning for succession in terms of a CEO, and then there was arguably the even more important succession of planning who would play the role of the controlling shareholder of Rogers. And that person ends up being his first and only son, Edward. Well, let me pick up on that, the issue of control. Because Ted died, it's a long time now, 2008. Mm -hmm. Ted died. His wife, Loretta, his children, Edward, the son, Melinda and Martha, they're on the board. Edward is chair of the Rogers Control Trust. Mm -hmm. Nadir Mohammed is the CEO of the company. Who's in charge? <laughs> well, I think that's a question that a lot of employees within the company have been asking for a long time because, you know, Ted did ultimately bypass his son and, you know, tell the board that the board could decide who the CEO would be, but he indicated a strong preference for Nadir, who, of course, is not a Rogers family member. He believed that having professional management um, would be the way to go. And at the same time, you do have Edward in charge as the chair of the Rogers Control Trust. And so this put employees in this kind of funny position where they have a CEO and then they have this chair. And sometimes the chair and the CEO were sort of at odds with one another. And some people talked about how that you know could put an employee in a very awkward position if they found themselves caught in between Nadir and Edward. Did that happen much? As I understand, it happened uh, not infrequently. <laughs> Uh, I, I guess you can understand this, right? Because on the one hand, the CEO is supposed to run the company. On the other hand, the chair, it's his name. So how did they resolve their differences when they had them? Yeah, it's not only just that it's his name, but it's also his dad's company, right? And obviously, Edward did make a play for the top job, as I report in some length, uh, the extents to which he went to try to become the CEO. And he has the ability to effectively push out the CEO, and he has the ability, as we've now learned, to effectively reconstitute the entire board, or at least all of the independent directors of Rogers, through a written resolution without even holding a shareholder meeting. And so Edward is uh, an incredibly powerful person in this whole saga. Um, ultimately, though, when Nadir did step down, it was, as I understand, quite amicably. He was in the role for about five years, and when 
when he left, there was sort of an orderly transition into recruiting a new CEO, and that CEO, of course, was Guy Lawrence. Who did not last long. He lasted uh, significantly shorter than Nadir. Mm -hmm. And it was kind of behind his back that this recruitment process for the next CEO, Joe Natale, was going on while Guy was still in the seat. Okay, let's... This is so bizarre. So let, let, we're going to talk about the butt dial now, except we're not sure it was a butt <laughs> dial. Uh, okay, let's set this up here. Joe Natale is the CEO at the time. They've got him from, he's left TELUS, right, to come to Rogers? He's been fired from TELUS. He's been fired from TELUS. He's now with Rogers. And he does not know, but finds out under the most bizarre circumstances, that there is a coup being plotted by Edward and Tony Staffieri, who's C. CFO or CFO, yeah, CFO Chief at the time. Officer. And somehow, okay, maybe you should pick up the story here. There's an <laughs> allegation of a butt dialed phone call in which Joe hears all about the plot to get him out. That's what right. do you think really happened there? So essentially, here's how it goes down. Joe Natale has just signed a deal for Rogers to acquire Shaw Communications. It's a $20 billion deal, right? And this is the deal of Ted Rogers' dreams. When Ted and J.R. Shaw, the founder of Shaw, essentially were building their cable empire simultaneously, there were two kind of infamous handshake deals in which they essentially carved the country into East and West. And people have always anticipated that one day those two Eastern and Western and cable families would come together, and Ted had always dreamed of having a national cable empire. And so Joe thinks things are going pretty well, understandably, seeing as he's just signed this deal, and they're now waiting on regulatory approval from not one but three government regulators. And so, you know, my initial understanding, as we reported in the Globe and Mail, was that it was a butt dial. But what I have since learned is that uh, the alleged phone call that took place was actually a butt answer. And that... Okay, hold that thought right there, because I want to, I actually want to read an excerpt from the book in which you touch on this, and then you can pick up the story. Sheldon, bottom of page two, let's do this. It was the end of a busy week of investor meetings, and Natalie was keen to catch up with Staffieri to discuss an issue involving credit rating agencies in relation to the Shaw deal. He opened a bottle of wine, poured himself a glass, and dialed. Natale found himself on a call with Staffieri, but Staffieri didn't seem to be aware that the call was taking place. Back to you, Alex. So according to the version of events that has emerged from Joe Natale's camp and which is now in several sworn court affidavits, is that you know, Staffieri is sitting there and he's talking about his plans for Rogers Communications, how he's going to remake the leadership ranks of the company when he imminently becomes the CEO of Rogers. Hmm. And, you know, this is like essentially something out of a Hollywood movie, right? That you would uh, accidentally answer a phone call inadvertently at that exact moment. And so, you know, Joe is shocked and he takes out a pen and paper and he starts scribbling down in detail what Staffieri's plans entail. This, of course, after he he attempted to make his presence known to Staffieri, but Staffieri didn't hear him. Um, and so that is one version of events. The other version of events from Tony's camp is that Joe had actually learned of the plan through some other way. There was, in fact, perhaps a phone call. Uh, it's unclear whether the call was answered. It's unclear whether, um, you know, Tony was actually having that kind of a conversation with the company's former chief legal officer. Uh, but the allegation from the other camp is that Joe actually went through Tony's private communications, his emails, his text messages, hmm. and found out that way. Now, this gets doubly complicated because the board gets very split on this. Edward Rogers is backing Tony. Some of the other independent directors, like former Premier David Peterson, are backing Joe Natale. How does that drama come to the fore at this moment? So essentially, Joe goes to Edward and he says he wants to fire Tony Staffieri. He can't trust him. And it's at that point that Edward says to Joe, don't blame Tony. This was not Tony's plan. This was my plan. And I don't agree with firing Tony, but I will work with you on an exit package if you would like to leave. Mm. Because, you know, Joe essentially makes a kind of an ultimatum. It's either I go or he goes. And so... Joe is taken aback, but, um, you know, he's lost, apparently, the confidence of the chair of the board and the chair of the trust. And so that's, he, Edward. that's Edward. And so he starts, you know, working with Alan Horn, the company's former chair, on an exit package. And everything seems to be going according to Edward's plan, despite the objections of David Peterson. Uh, 
And then things kind of change. And essentially what ends up happening is that David Peterson makes this impassioned speech at the board and a number of other directors come forward. And they also have concerns about parting with the CEO at the time when the company is looking to consummate this major deal. And it's not just the CEO that they're going to be parting with. It's also the vast majority of the company's C-suite leadership team who you know, were also contemplated to be exiting as part of this plan. And so uh, some directors are very concerned that this would be very destabilizing for the company at what is essentially this crucial moment. Because nobody in the family disagrees with the plan of acquiring Shaw, right? This is the one thing that everyone is completely allied on is the importance of this deal. But this company is in crisis in the midst of the biggest takeover deal in the history of the country. That's right. That can't be good. No, I don't think it can. <laughs> uh, okay, so then the, the board sort of divvies up and it becomes Rogers versus Rogers. That's right. In court. Okay, explain that. What does that mean? Well, so what ends up happening is that the board ends up voting to remove Edward as chair, and Edward effectively decides that he's going to replace the independent directors who have gone against him, and he does so through this little-known mechanism called a written shareholder resolution, which people don't realize is possible because Rogers is actually incorporated in British Columbia, which people don't know because their headquarters are here in Toronto, mm -hmm. but they're incorporated in BC, which is something that Ted had done back in the day uh, for various reasons, including uh, tax reasons. And so it's the BC Corporations Act that is unique in allowing for a board to be reconstituted essentially without holding a meeting of the shareholders. Hmm. Now, even if Rogers did have a shareholder meeting, Meeting, it's pretty clear what would have happened, which is that Edward would have gotten his way because 97.5% of the voting stock of Rogers is held within trusts that Edward controls. However, by having a shareholder meeting, it would have bought some time. The shareholders could have come out and asked questions, asked for some rationale as to why these changes were being contemplated because, of course, at that, part, at that point, Edward had said very little about why he wanted to make these leadership changes and both at the management level and at the board and so you know it would have allowed for greater transparency well let me pick up on that because you, you you've approached this book very much like a reporter you are getting all sides you're putting the information out there and basically the the reader is going to make up his or her own decision but I wonder whether you came to any conclusions yourself as to because at the end of the day this is a bit of a story about governance mm -hmm. and about you know who's allowed to do what and is this any way to run a railroad did you come to any conclusions about that yourself well, I mean, as a reporter, my personal belief is always in holding power to account, and it's in transparency. And one of the things that I have found surprising throughout reporting on this saga is that there's this whole Byzantine structure at the very top of Rogers Communications that doesn't allow for a lot of transparency. So, for example, when you look at the Rogers Control Trust, it has this advisory committee of 10 members. Uh, most of these are Rogers family members and Rogers family member friends. And technically, the company does not even have to disclose changes to the structure of this committee. And so as public shareholders, those of us who own shares of Rogers that don't give um, the ability to vote on major decisions such as, you know, the board and, and leadership and major transactions and other things of that nature, um, you know, it would put, I believe, the class B, the subordinated shareholders on a more equal footing with the class A shareholders to at least have the ability to see more of what's happening in, you know, for example, changes to this advisory committee, things mm. that are happening at the trust level. And so as a journalist, my main priority has been to bring as much transparency to the issue. Obviously, a lot of things that have happened here in the story, they're quite anomalous, right? We don't see this kind of very public feud in the ranks of a very wealthy, very prominent, and very powerful family in Canada Ted, very often. Ted Rogers' daughter, Martha, was on Twitter a lot, absolutely carving her brother a new one on regular occasions. How did everybody deal with that? Some of those tweets, actually funny you should mention that, some of those tweets were actually submitted by Edward's lawyers in court. 
Um, I mean, look, in the end, what ended up happening is that you know, the reason why I was not able to, for instance, sit down and have, you know, lengthy on the record interviews with members of the Rogers family is because they had all agreed to this standstill that essentially prevented them from being able to, you know, say anything to the press that might be seen as disparaging of one another until mm -hmm. the deal closed, because we did have this conflict break out at this very crucial moment while the deal was still in the works and nobody wanted to jeopardize that. And so I think it was largely in response to those tweets and to uh, a couple of interviews that Melinda gave, one to me at The Globe and another to Bloomberg, uh, that that standstill agreement came to be. She got in trouble for doing that. She certainly did. Yeah, she did. You ever see the TV show Succession? Of course I have, <laughs> obsessively. I always thought that Great was a show. show about the Murdochs, but it turns out it might very well have been about the Rogerses. And th there is a moment, I think, we, I think, do we have this clip? Are we going to play this clip? I hope we're bleeping this clip because... <laughs> Okay, set it up again. Brian Cox, who's the head of Waystar Royco, he is the, the head of this very dysfunctional family, but he's a phenomenal character. He gets hired by somebody to do a video for Edward Rogers. Uh, okay, I'm not gonna say any more. Let's just, uh, okay, let's play it. Go ahead, Sheldon. Edward, this is from Suzanne. Congratulations on your real-life succession at Rogers Communications. And also having Joe Natale to f*** the f*** off. Well done, Edward. Congratulations. That's actually mildly bad language compared to what he has said in the TV show. But anyway, when... You guys broke that story, right? We did. At the Globe and Mail. That's right. When you first saw... First of all... Okay, I know you're not going to answer this, but I'm going to ask anyway. How'd you get a hold of that? <laughs> <laughs> I have my sources. Yeah, there you go. Okay. When you first saw it, what'd you think? For me, this was such a bizarre moment because I had been covering this saga while the third season of Succession was playing out on HBO simultaneously, which was such a crazy thing in the first place. And then when I saw this video, it was just like the walls between fiction and reality came crumbling down because now the two storylines are crossing over into each other. And so it was this kind of mind blowing moment for me. I think I watched that clip four or five times in a row before I even you know, told anyone that I had it. Um, I don't think Joe Natale was as um, impressed with this uh, clip as perhaps uh, other people may have been. Do you know whether Edward enjoyed the clip? So I, what I reported in my book and what has come out in court files is that he sent it around to various family and friends. Which presumably you don't do if you didn't think it was kind of cool. That's right. Okay. One might assume. I want to circle back to something you said a few minutes ago, which is one of the things your book tries to do is, is explain how... This is not a very big country at the end of the day, right? No. There's a great deal of business incestuousness in this country, and your book talks a lot about it. What do you think it says about the nature of the way the, the super-rich do business in this country? Yeah, that's a great question. I think what this book really uh, taught me and hopefully will teach readers is just how cozy the Canadian business world really is, right? So you have this fight playing out in this you know wealthy, prominent, and powerful family. And who's in the middle of it? You've got a former Ontario premier. You've got someone who was at the time the sitting mayor of Toronto, John Tory, who's trying to mediate the whole thing. You've got a presentation being delivered to the Rogers Control Trust Advisory Committee members by none other than Dale Lassman, who, of course, is the son of Mel Lassman, and, and Dale, of course... Another Toronto mayor. Another former Toronto mayor. And Dale, of course, is on the board of MLSC, which uh, owns the some of the most uh, profitable sports S Small empires. little $8 billion <laughs> empire, yeah. Uh, in the country, and so... And then, of course, you've got all these connections between the telcos, right? You look at... Um, Joe Natale, who was at the helm of Rogers, he had come from running TELUS, right? And of course, there was a huge fight between TELUS and Rogers about trying to free Joe from his non-compete. Uh, and ultimately, Rogers ends up paying TELUS a bunch of money and other benefits so that Joe can come and work 
earlier than you know the two years that he was contractually uh, under his non-compete for. And so, and then at the same time, you do have this coziness, and at the same time, you've got this kind of ruthlessness between the telecoms themselves. If you look at, for example, the lengths to which Bell and Telus went to try to kill, slow, and shape, as they say in a Telus presentation, <laughs> the Roger Shaw deal. Um, I think what's really interesting is how, you know, the Canadian business world is so cozy and close and yet at the same time can kind of turn on one another and be so ruthless. Did you come to any conclusions yourself based on looking, based on your reportage, did you come to any conclusions as to whether or not the Rogers Shaw $20 billion deal is in the interests of Canadian consumers? I'm still torn. I think what we've seen so far has been kind of a mixed bag. Um, the competition tribunal, of course, ended up coming out and saying that the deal with the divestiture of Shaw's Freedom Mobile, which was Canada's fourth largest wireless carrier to Quebec or would actually be a positive thing for competition because Shaw just didn't have it in them to compete anymore. They wanted out. And meanwhile, Quebec or wanted to expand their telecom business outside of Quebec, make it more of a national player. And so this was seen as being good. But as a telecom consumer, I mean, you're not exactly seeing drastically lower prices. I mean, you know, when the merger was first consummated, we did see some competitive offers from Rogers and other telecoms uh, looking to match them. But then also, you know, we've seen, we, we saw some elevated uh, customer turnover, so higher churn, which means customers switching carriers more. So that's always kind of an indication of heightened competition. But then since then, we've also seen some price hikes announced by Rogers and Bell for some of their out of contract customers. And we've seen some comments from the Competition Bureau about how some telecom services are now costing more particularly in Western Canada, which had been the Bureau's concern and the reason why they went in front of the tribunal and tried to block the merger. I think with deals like this, it can take a very long time before you really see what the final impact of that consolidation is going to be. There are four Rogers kids. How well or not are they getting on these days? Well, what we have seen, uh, there's been some kind of changes in the family dynamic. So for one thing, Edward's uh, oldest sister or older sister, Lisa, has joined the board. Lisa had actually backed Edward at the control trust at the family level. Um, so she's been added to the board. And meanwhile, Melinda and Martha, the two sisters who had gone against Edward, they've agreed to step down from the board. And this is as the result of a settlement, a the terms of the settlement are confidential, so we don't know what they got in exchange for stepping down, but they have now stepped down from the board. Uh, meanwhile, uh, sadly, Loretta, the family matriarch, has passed away, as have two of Ted's longtime lieutenants, Alan Horn and Phil Lind, mm -hmm. who, of course, had backed Edward as well. And so what we now see with mom and dad gone and two of dad's closest friends gone, you know, this kind of current generation of Roger's kids is left on their own and um, hopefully with some peace between them now that, you know, Melinda and Martha have decided to move on and do other things with their lives. But it's unquestionably Edward's company now, isn't it? That is, that is correct. I'm going to finish off on a very bizarre question way out of left field right now. Do you know how many pages your book is not including the epilogue, like just the chapters itself. Do you know how many pages it runs? 350-ish. Now that's including. I mean excluding the epilogue. I don't. 333. <laughs> Do you know their address on Bloor Street? 333. I love that. Coincidence? I think not. <laughs> did you do that on purpose? I, did, I didn't. I didn't. You didn't, eh? No, it's total out that coincidence, way. yeah. Oh, I'm looking for conspiracies where I can find them. <laughs> well, that's the human mind at work. That's what we all do, right? We there look we for connections. Alex, great job. It's really a terrific read. Rogers versus Rogers, the battle for control of Canada's telecom empire. Alexandra Posadsky. Dziękuję bardzo. Dziękuję. <laughs> How do academics keep students engaged during a whole lecture? By keeping them curious. Have a look. My name is Steve Jordans. Uh, I'm a professor of psychology here at the University of Toronto Scarborough. 
Academics are all about learning, all about discovering new things, and curiosity is really the force that drives all of that. And so understanding that driving force, how it works, and how we can harness it um, is a big part of what we do. And they would go through all of these books and say, for every million words, how many of them are sustainability? When we're thinking what is curiosity driven learning, how can we actually express that in a psychological way? We often think back to the work of Bluma Zygarni. Bluma was very uh, famous for saying, the mind does not like unfinished business. Anytime we get part of a story but we don't get the conclusion, we crave to know that conclusion. Uh, and so the mind keeps coming back to that. And that's really what curiosity typically is. We typically get a germ of something, enough to make us think, huh? And then we want to get the rest of that story, where the mind does not like just stopping there. The really important thing to understand about curiosity is the mind hates unfinished business. And so if you start to introduce something or if you catch, catch their mind, but then don't complete that thought or that idea, then they want to keep thinking about it more. And so in the classroom, we'll often begin a class with something that's meant to induce curiosity, something that's supposed to grab their mind and make them wonder, how is that happening? Um, and then we don't tell them. Because <laughs> one of the things I'm going to try to do is to induce some curiosity, get you thinking about something. And I don't want you just to resolve that curiosity. I don't want you just to go find, find the answer too quick. I want you to kind of carry that through the lecture. Um, and then by the end of the lecture, then I would like to resolve that curiosity and show you how it all fits together. So in the classroom, what we'll often do is begin the class by trying to induce familiarity. And we do that by telling you know, part of a story that is perhaps unexpected or surprising to them, but we don't tell them the whole story. We tell them enough to get them thinking, how could that work? Um, and then we just leave it and we go through a lecture where we talk about things that once they all stack up and come together, they explain that thing we talked about in the beginning. So in the meantime, the students are trying to figure out how does this all fit? And it's an approach we use to keep them engaged, to kind of keep their phones on the table and their eyes on us and their ears on us. Um, and hopefully that makes for a better lecture experience for them. And it certainly does for us because we have their attention and that's what's important. Let's start with that headline. Father ruled insane in boys' decapitation. Wow, this sounds like a conspiracy theory kind of thing, doesn't it? Um, so this is a sort of story that I want you to understand is out there, and I want you to think about this, kind of think about it sort of like a detective, but like a detective that understands the brain and is trying to understand what possibly could be happening in a person's mind, in a person's brain, for this sort of behavior. So, a Louisiana... It was just so engaging, and it kept me hooked till the very end because I really wanted to know what he was hiding from so long, so I think that kept me curious. When I came to know the syndrome, I finally had the peace in my head. I was like, oh, thank God, like, finally, I know what it was all along. But I think, yeah, then I felt this satisfaction in my head that, oh, finally, I was curious all along, now I'm calm and composed, and now I know what it was. And so, How do you work against students following their curiosity on their screens? Yeah, I, I mean, that, that's the problem. So we're, we're competing, and that's one of the things we have to learn about technology now, that every student has something that's right in front of them trying to pull their mind out of the lecture. And if we don't compete with that, if we present sort of a boring, traditional-style lecture, we're going to lose. And so that's really what curiosity is about to an extent, is trying to say, hey, this, what's going on in here is more interesting than what's going on there. And it's worth your time to kind of plug in and pay attention. And the best way to do that is to get them wondering about something, get them thinking, wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. How could that be? Um, and so that's you know, a good way to actually put it, is curiosity is our way of competing with technology. It's up to, to look at your phone. I was tempted. I did turn it off and put it in my bag um, because I know like I've been in his AO1 class, so I know he has a very interactive class. Um, so I knew something was coming, but I was tempted. Yeah. He is a very interactive professor, but what he does very differently in comparison to a lot of my other professors is that he doesn't really start with an object like a list of objectives for the lesson. So instead, he actually focuses more on like a problem or an interaction uh, that he can have with students. And so students can start like thinking about what the topic may be or how we must be able to find like an end mean for it. 
and so it kind of just brings you along like a journey and so he connects like all the slides together and it really does create more like a storytelling um, point of view rather than just like this is what this lecture is about. Once curiosity kicks in they're not learning now because they want to get an A or because there's some sort of reward some sort of external thing they're chasing they're they're learning now because they want to know and that sort of learning that sort of intrinsically driven curiosity is the most powerful form of learning there is now as they're learning as they're finding out things it's, it's important to them. It's putting a puzzle together. They're starting to get pieces of this puzzle. And so every piece becomes a little more valuable um, and you know, as they put together that puzzle. And so that's really why we like it. You can say, hey, listen, students, and maybe you'll get an A. That's what we call extrinsic rewards. Or we can say, what do you think is going on here? Isn't this weird? And that is a whole different kind of mindset and a much more powerful one for learning. Research underway at Toronto General Hospital employs an unconventional treatment for a range of mental health issues. Here's that story. Hi, I'm Eric Bombaccino. I'm a producer on The Agenda, and we are standing outside of Toronto General Hospital. And today we are going to be visiting the most beautiful room in this here hospital. This is where they're doing psilocybin assisted therapy, which is the active ingredient in magic mushrooms. This therapy is being used to treat a range of mental health disorders from addiction, to depression, to anxiety, to anxiety related to terminal health diagnoses, to OCD and even anorexia. I mean, the list goes on and on. We're here with Emma Hapke. Hi, Emma. Hi. She is the Associate Director of the University Health Network Psychedelic Psychotherapy Research Group. Why does it matter so much to make this room so beautiful and calming for people? So when people take a psychedelic medicine, uh, they become very exquisitely sensitive to the environment around them. And the earlier researchers in the 1950s and 60s came up with this idea that set and setting really matter. And so the setting is this room and, it's the, and it also is the therapist and the therapist's presence that creates this environment that ultimately allows the patient to trust and surrender to the psychedelic experience. So let's pretend I'm gonna be doing this therapy today. Mm -hmm. I walk into this room, I say, hi, Emma. Mm -hmm. I get into the bed, what happens mm -hmm. next? So one thing is, um, even before coming to the psychedelic session, you mm -hmm. would have gone through a pretty intensive screening process and a minimum of usually at least three preparatory sessions. And the current model that we work with actually has two therapists for one patient. So when it comes to the day um, of your dosing session, mm. your two therapists would meet you. Initially, we would start actually on the couch area and we would um, chat with you, go over the agreements for the day and kind of review your intentions and what you're hoping to get out of the session. We like to use some form of ritual to kind of mark the transition from ordinary to non-ordinary okay. state of consciousness. So we'll use a Koshi chime or a bell and then you'll go to the bed. And at that point, you take the medicine. And then the next thing that happens is you'll put on headphones and an eye mask and music starts. We have surround sound speakers and the same music plays through the headphones and you begin your inward journey. And depending on the medicine you take, that could be anywhere from, you know, 90 minutes to eight hours. Um, so psilocybin, one of the really common medicines that we work with, lasts on average about four to six hours for most people. And as a therapist, you're there the whole time with them. We are, yeah. That's part of why we work in pairs so that when we can take turns, we'll right. go and have lunch and use the washroom because we want to make sure there's always at least one of us present. But, but really for the majority, it's the two therapists there with the yeah. participant or the patient the entire time. So I have a blindfold on me if I were to mm -hmm. do this. Why a blindfold? When people close their eyes on the psychedelic mm -hmm. um, experience, it's very different than when they're oriented outward. So that encourages them to go inward. Right. And when we talk about psychedelic healing, we talk about this idea of the inner healing intelligence. It's our, just like our body kind of innately knows how to heal, our mind also wants to move towards wholeness. Mm -hmm. And what we encourage people to do is trust that their own inner healing intelligence is gonna bring up the feelings, the memories, the experiences, 
experiences that are most in service of their healing. And so having that blindfold on really does encourage them to go inward. But people are also free at any point to take off right. their mask and, and chat with us. So it's not strict. It, we really yeah. follow really what works for them and their own intuition. Mm -hmm. And then there's the music. Mm -hmm. Everybody loves a good DJ. <laughs> how important is it yeah. to choose the right music? And how important is the role of music in this experience mm -hmm. for people? Yeah, so the music we think is really of critical importance right. to creating that overall setting for people. So we put a lot of time and thought into carefully curating playlists for our patients. We intentionally pick music that doesn't have um, lyrics in a language mm -hmm. that they understand because that will then take them out of the experience that they're having because they can understand the words. We want music that supports both contains and supports flow. Right. Um, so it, it structures, but also allows that opening um, and kind of easing in. One of the things that happens when you take a psychedelic like psilocybin mm -hmm. is there's something called synesthesia. And that's where your senses start to kind of meld together. So people can actually hear colors or see sounds, which Whoa. is um, you know, it's hard to describe in that unless you've actually experienced it. And so people, the, the music really takes on these different chapters and, and really influences what people are feeling, seeing, hearing, experiencing. So in terms of the healing that you're talking about, we'll have mm -hmm. to go in here a little slow. There's lots to unpack. Mm -hmm. But what sort of experiences are people having during these sometimes mm -hmm. six hour sessions? So the first thing you know that happens when you take a psychedelic is there's these perceptual changes. So mm -hmm. people will see fractal patterns, bright colors, kaleidoscopes, but it's also, these are visionary medicines. And so pe people get visions of people, places, things, and even archetypal content like angels and demons. We go way beyond the norms of mm -hmm. kind of Western psychiatry in terms of the types of visions that people get. The best way I like to describe it is it's like a waking dream. Um, and so the other thing that happens when you take psilocybin is your ego, your normal sense of self starts to dissolve away and soften. And for some people that can be quite scary. So right. we provide them a lot of preparation for that and also just a lot of support um, on the day of. And as that normal sense of self starts to kind of dissolve away, lots of different things can come up. And, right. and no two psychedelic experiences are the same. Um, but what we commonly see is these big emotional, big pieces of emotion come up and there's a lot of emotional catharsis and processing that happens. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is a lot of biographical detail and past trauma can be brought up and actually re-experience. People actually feel like they're right back there reliving it, but doing so in a contained environment with emotional support to process can help people release what was stuck in some of those past traumatic experiences and, and that's part of the healing. We see this with psilocybin and in some of the studies we're seeing two thirds of people are having what's called a mystical experience. Whoa. And that's where like the normal boundaries of the self really start to dissolve and people describe sort of merging with the universe. There can be this profound positive mood, bliss, unity. People talk a lot about love and the healing power of love. Yeah. And they have a lot of insights that they bring back from those mystical experiences that we then try to help them weave into their lives. So there's this old saying that I love called, if, if you resist, it persists. Mm -hmm. If you resist this pain that you've pushed down, it will persist. Mm -hmm. And so is a good way of looking at this therapy is people are able to access buried feelings, even traumas mm -hmm. that they may not even know were there. So uh, we use the term, it helps people overcome experiential avoidance. Okay. A lot of what keeps people stuck is it's human nature to want to avoid pain and go towards um, pleasure. And so we push down and look away from all of the difficult past things that, yeah. have, that have happened to us, but they're still affecting us on many ways. And so this, with the help of the medicine, it's like we're, we're almost forced to look at what's there. And we learn that actually when we look at it, we can work through it, a sense of mastery emerges and people are then supported to process those really difficult things. And ultimately that leads to a lightening and a lessening of their pain. Is this a grieving process? This helps jumpstart People have great losses in their lives and this can you can you can see them beginning a grieving process in that bed sometimes yes very much so we see i think grief is one of the indications for which psilocybin therapy is um, we're seeing it's particularly helpful for we work a lot with people at the end of life often treating people who are dying as young you know in their teens and 20s and 30s yeah and there's often so much unprocessed grief and Oftentimes they also don't necessarily feel they're, they don't want to burden their loved ones by 
putting that grief onto them. And so they come in here in this safe space with the support of therapists and the medicine. And it's really this unbridled expression of deep, deep pain. And I, we've seen some patients cry like being almost the entire six to eight hours. But after they report feeling a lot lighter, um, they feel they had a different perspective on their grief. They've let something go. And they, they often talk about being more able to live with the remaining time that they have. So there's traditional psychotherapy that can sometimes take years for people to make progress and to get in touch with some of these feelings. Do you find with psilocybin therapy, it kind of speeds the process up? I certainly think that uh, psychedelic therapy catalyzes the therapeutic process. Right. So I do think we might see gains faster in psychedelic therapy and it also seems to facilitate people going deeper Mm -hmm. quicker. But the other thing that uh, psilocybin does, for example, is it really induces the state of neuroplasticity in the right. brain. So if we take the, the example, some of my depressed patients, for example, like they really, really struggle with something that many of us take for granted, like going for a walk. Mm -hmm. Like actually for them, going for a walk when you have severe depression is really, really hard. But what we see is that the psilocybin disrupts behavior and it gives them like a reset. And then they might it might just be a lot easier easier the day after the psilocybin to then be able to go for that walk. Yeah. But then we work with them really closely in the integration period because their brain is in this changeable state and changeable is neutral. So we have to direct that change into positive outcomes by really supporting them to make new choices, to try new things. Yeah. We call it behavioral activation. So this is probably a good time for my favorite analogy. Yeah. I know you've heard this one a bunch mm -hmm. of times, but it's sort of it, picture like a ski hill, right? where you have all of these well-worn tracks, these grooved in ways of thinking for people that can be often toxic and negative and kind of inescapable. But psilocybin and the experience of it is kind of like putting down a fresh coat of snow. Mm -hmm. And so they can kind of think differently and move to different places. Mm -hmm. is, that a, is that a helpful analogy yeah. here to, to figure this out? I think so. Like when we see a lot of the, the disorders that psilocybin seems to work for are places where people are really stuck Right. in repetitive thought patterns and maladaptive behaviors. And there's this stuckness. And as much as they're trying, and they're trying really hard, they have a hard time shifting how they're thinking, feeling, and acting. And so what that coat of snow is with the psychedelic is that the psychedelic introduces neuroplasticity. And then along with the therapeutic support, it's like we're, you get that fresh coat of snow but the therapeutic support is teaching them how to ski in a different direction. And that's why it's really not just the medicine, but the entire treatment that's so important. Now, those, those patterns of thinking that are now you've got this fresh coat of snow, mm -hmm. do they return for people? They can, yeah. And that's yeah. something that we're still really learning in the field. Um, so with, what we're, what, with some of the depression research, we're seeing that the effects you know, for some patients, they get better and stay better, but for others, it, it seems to come back after a few weeks or a few months. When these old thought patterns come back, do people sometimes respond to them differently? Do they yes. see these thoughts as different things than they once were? Yeah, I would say that what I've seen is that like, even if the, some of the old thinking comes back, people are less identified with it okay. um, and they, they can see it more for what it is. And now they have these new tools and strategies that have developed in that integration period for dealing with it. So even when it comes back, it's often not as severe and they're better resourced to be able to handle it. It's almost push away those thoughts sometimes. Yeah, or just even be able to notice them without identifying with them so that they're more likely to just be able to pass through their consciousness as opposed to be embedded. So yeah, we're gonna get in the weeds here a little bit. Sure. But there's your thoughts and mm -hmm. then there's you. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times it's easy to think you are your thoughts. Mm -hmm. So in this case, people have these thoughts and are not identifying with them as strongly. Yeah. Is that a fair way to put it? Yeah, so what we know in, from some of the research is that psilocybin increases mindfulness. Um, and so that increases the ability to be the witness or the observer of your thoughts as opposed to actually being lost or um, identified with the thoughts. And we know mindfulness-based therapies are really helpful for a variety of uh, mental illnesses. So I found in my, I'm gonna bring me into this just for a sure, second. We'll probably yeah. cut this out. <laughs> uh, I find in my worst moments, I can feel like my mind is a million miles away from my body. Mm. Like I'm just completely caught up in those tumbling mm -hmm. patterns. 
Does this therapy help people bring themselves back to their body? Yes, very much so. So the one of the things that we really see with psilocybin is it increases a sense of embodiment and it helps people get out of their head and more into the body. And so we have um, certain integrative practices that we encourage people to kind of build that connection with their body and being more inside. We really see with the psilocybin that it opens people, both yeah. to themselves, but also to the world around them. And I'm always fascinated, again and again, people come out of these psilocybin experiences with this increased connection to our planet and with this sort of environmental drive to do more for our planet and wanting to spend time with the trees, with the waters, with the earth. And it's always, it's really beautiful to watch. I feel like we're coming up with a few lessons here. One is feel your feelings. Yes. You know, easier said than the done. The only way through is through. The only, the only way, way is out through. is through. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one is, is a lot of pain comes from kind of self-reference. And the more you can stop thinking about yourself, the more you can actually be free to be in the world a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I would say that like, you know, it, it's liberating to feel connected. It's, it, you're still connected to yourself, but also feeling connected to everything else. So many of our patients and um, even our society, people feel a lot of loneliness right. and isolation. And that I think intensifies and perpetuates people's suffering. And so to come out of these experiences more open, more willing and able to engage with other people in the world around them is a big part of how this heals people. So you see a lot of people six months, even a year after doing a single dose of mm -hmm. psilocybin, perhaps saying they feel less lonely. Yes. And we encourage... Uh, so. At our center, we're developing an ongoing integration group so that there's a built-in community so that people can continue to come in an indefinite way and connect with others that have had these experiences. Um, so building in community into the integration process for people is, yeah. is also part of it. You mentioned mystical experiences. Mm -hmm. In terms of having these very real spiritual or mystical experiences, is this offering people something that can permanently change them? I think we are seeing that, um, you know, when, when we think about spirituality in the context of psychedelics, I think of it really, really broadly and in just connecting to something bigger than right. yourself. For some people, that's creativity, community, nature, meaning and purpose. And for some people, it's a faith in a, in a particular God. Mm -hmm. And what we see is that the, the medicine seem to open people to that spiritual realm, and this is a level on which the healing is happening. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes those shifts can be permanent, and most people report that that's a really positive thing for them. So, so getting rid of the ego can really help people heal. Quieting, getting rid of yourself. Quieting yeah. these repetitive thoughts that keep us stuck yeah. allows us to these deeper states of connection. I feel like some people could relate to that even if they have never done this. I think some of the, the, I mean, we mentioned a ski hill. Mm -hmm. When you're actually skiing, it's really enjoyable mm -hmm. because you're going down a hill and you're not in your head and you're mm -hmm. in the world. I like playing hockey every week because mm -hmm. I'm out playing hockey. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the activities people like to do are naturally these things that get you out of your head Absolutely. and into the world. Yeah, like people talk about the idea of a flow state yes, where the yeah, mind's yeah. quieter, time kind of suspends and you're just really present. And I think that's the other offering that psychedelics bring us is that they help us become more in the present moment, which is actually where life happens. Mm -hmm. A lot of um, mental illness people are stuck in the past or projecting into an anxious yeah. future. Yeah. And it's here in the present is where the richness of life actually lives. Psychedelic assisted therapy is being applied to a wide range of mental disorders. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna name a few, you can add a few mm -hmm. more to the list if you want. Depression, anxiety, anxiety related to terminal health diagnoses, uh, anorexia most recently, OCD. Mm -hmm. uh, do we want to add a few more to that? Um, yeah, so I mean, it's it's good for, it's really good for disorders, with, especially psilocybin we're seeing where the mind is stuck in those repetitive yeah. thought patterns. So that would be like obsessive compulsive disorder, the perfectionism and eating disorders like anorexia, the rumination and depression. Um, then it's also really good for uh, disorders where we need to disrupt the behavioral patterns with so substance use disorders. It's showing really promising results. They had a pilot study. It's still very early research, but in a pilot study for tobacco addiction, they found at six months, 80% of people had quit smoking and were no longer smoking, which is way higher percentage than other um, treatments for smoking sensation and we're getting good results for alcohol use disorder as well and there's some really interesting work going on with opiates and the um the opiate crisis yeah so that would be that and then you mentioned end of life distress it really seems to help people 
um, grapple with dying and the dying process. I had one mother who was dying and, and bef before um, she took the psilocybin, she couldn't even tell her kids that she was dying, like it was too painful. And in the experience, she experienced her own death. She felt that she was dying into love and she totally lost her fear of death after that. She started being able to talk to her kids, say goodbye to people. And the, the, it really profoundly changed the last six months of her life where she said, I'm no longer living treatment to treatment. I'm actually living to live. And it was just a very meaningful experience for her. And we're seeing this, we're seeing these stories happen often in, in terms the of The end this, of yeah. life, uh, um, that's one, one area of research that we're really focused on here. We have a partnership with Princess Margaret Hospital and, um, you know, in, in science, we call the effect size, which is how effective an intervention is. And right. it's so high in the end of life population. So that's one area where this seems to be really, really promising. So you have all these different categories of mental illness. Mm -hmm. The DSM, which is psychiatry's Bible, separates them. Are we learning mm -hmm. through these therapies that there is kind of this common underlying mechanism to a lot of mental illness? I think that there's a lot of interesting work kind of grappling with that question. Um, you know, we, again, a lot of the disorders come down to these maladaptive thinking and maladaptive behavior. And then by bringing in the psychedelic with, with therapy, so neuroplasticity but plus support seems to disrupt that the, the stuck thinking and behaviors that are really at the heart of a lot of different mental illnesses. And I think that, that that sense of connection and getting people more connected, it doesn't matter what mental illness you have, feeling more connected is healing for mm -hmm. people. So how deep are we into studying these types of therapies? So we, we're in, we're officially in this psychedelic renaissance, as okay. they like to call it. You know, there was a lot of work, even work done in Canada in the mm -hmm. 1950s and 60s, and they were getting really promising results. Um, but then because of the war on drugs, that all got shut down for over 30 years. Yeah, and I then think it, in Saskatchewan, mm -hmm. you, you could qualify for government-funded LSD therapy for alcoholism. Yeah, and, and during yeah that time there was period, some yeah. really interesting work going on in Weyburn, Saskatchewan with um, Humphrey Osman, who's a British psychiatrist who is studying uh, psychedelics mm -hmm. here in Canada. And I would say over the last 10 years, we've just seen an explosion. There's research centers popping up all over the world. Lots of really interesting work going on. You know, it's still early days. There's right. way more that we don't know than that what we know. It's important to remain really humble. I think mm -hmm. it's um, it's not a magic bullet. I tell people you're stepping onto a healing path, mm -hmm. um, but it it's a type of therapy where it shows you what's inside and you have to then do the hard work right. of processing that and making the changes. And so there's a lot that we need to learn still about challenging experiences and adverse events and that kind of thing that's, yeah. that's coming out. But it's a very exciting time to be studying this area. So we're in the psychedelic renaissance. Mm -hmm. How hopeful are you for the future of this? I like to say I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, generally speaking, I'm really hopeful. You know, I got into this field originally um, because we needed better treatments for our patients. I saw that I was taught this host of therapies and meds, and yet there was this, you know, a chunk of patients that our treatments just didn't work for. And so we need we need better treatments. And this to me is the a really promising area of mental health research. So I feel very hopeful for the future. Well, thank you for having us here. Thank you so much for coming. Tomorrow on the agenda. Wait a second. My, my, <laughs> I think my head's about to... Did, did Premier Ford just say that the mayor of Vaughan, Stephen Del Duca, knows best? Uh, that's what he said. That's tomorrow on the agenda.